You're tuning into the Active Mom Podcast with physical therapist, Dr. Carrie Pagliano, a real mom's guide to all things postpartum return to workouts after baby. If you're a postpartum mom, coach, trainer, or physical therapist looking for answers on how to get back to running, CrossFit, yoga, Pilates, HIIT, you name it without the fear of pelvic floor issues or doing something wrong, this is the podcast for you. Let's start the show. All right. A few episodes ago, we spoke with Amanda Olson of Intimate Rose and asked her the question that I always ask my guests is who should we know kind of in pregnancy, postpartum space or in sports and running and and whatnot. And she gave me a name. She gave me the name of Christine Agresta. And I went and did a little Google stalking and I have been looking for somebody to talk about uh, running shoes and kind of unpack that for us. And I reached out and she said yes. And so we have Dr. Christina Gresta from uh, University of Washington here with us today. Thanks so much, uh, Christine, for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. How did you get, give us the the quick down and dirty. How did you get involved with uh, running, running shoes, all that good stuff? Yeah, so, um, so I, you know, went to PT PT school and like most people were active and I moved to Chicago, started my first job, you know, running, running, training for marathons. And somehow um, I worked for Health South and uh, we were partnered up with Chicago Air Runners Association. And so they asked, you know, you're, you like to run. Do you want to start treating runners or do an information session at one of their running sites? And I said, yes. And it, it kind of snowballed after that. And I ended up seeing lots and lots of uh, endurance runners. Um, and that led me to have some questions and, you know, kind of want to further uh, develop into my research. And so I decided to go back and get my PhD after treating four years. And I wanted to do running as well, <laughs> look at running injuries and, and kind of um, adaptation, really. And so I kind of kept just, you know, saying yes to things that I was interested in, just kind of kept moving towards um, these projects that involved runners and, uh, running shoes and, you know, asking information about, uh, running strollers, design of running strollers, uh, so focus on uh, pe- pregnancy and postpartum, but I'm really interested in looking at, you know, how do we pick the right things to invest? How do we monitor, um, how do we monitor patients? How do we monitor, monitor features so that we can understand if people are training too much, tra- not training enough, and kind of uh, build some resilience or at least help uh, not tip people over the edge into this injury, you know, making this making injuries severe. And so that um, led me to look at how people adapt and in context. And there's no um, there, there's no one that changes more than women over time, right? You go you go to puberty and you have to change your body changes real fast, yes. and you got to adapt to that. And then you go you're being pregnant. And your body changes again. You have to adapt. You become unpregnant. You got to readapt to the world, and you know so on and so forth. And so the pregnancy was really kind of a good um, use case, so to speak, for studying adaptation. Yes, and my you, PhD or my and, post- and postdoc. You come to that from um, some knowing too, because you've got a couple of kids as well, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. I, I yeah. love when uh, researchers have that um, kind of experiential background because I think it just encourages us even more because we go through it. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so we're going to pick your mom brain as well as your uh, your sports and, and ortho and shoe and, and uh, PhD brain today. So I'm excited to, to dive into this a little bit. All right, so let's go super basic. Um, okay. Where do we go wrong as runners, as PTs, as coaches? with just general running shoe recommendations. So like not even pregnancy postpartum, but like, where do we mess this up? Because we do. Yeah, I think the, the what I see the most is following old blanket general recommendations. So the first one would be the pronation. Oh, you know, pronation yes. control or fixing pronation. So, you know, it when I was a, in PT school many, 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 many years ago on my first clinical rotation, my CI asked me to go running. And I was like, sure, of course. Um, and I walked out and I had the old, do you remember the old Nike Pegasus? They were like socks. 
Right? Oh, girl, and I like, had like some of the OG ones. I think we're probably same yes. vintage. So yes, no, I yeah. understand you. <laughs> so I walked out, I walked out and she was like, oh, you are not going to run in those. And I was like, right. I, 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 yeah, I, I am going to run those. I look fine. She's like, no, you need motion control. You need to wear, you need to build up, you know, like the, the thick medial yes. arch sole. She's like, you can't run in those. You're going to get hurt. I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's see. So I think that the one thing that I see, you know, over and over again is that we we held on to a theory that was a, a, a you know, a supported theory, but tested came unproven and we just kind of held on to that. Right. So, and so we continue to, to see that I continue to see that when I go into fleet feet or into yes. you know, any of the running shoe specialty stores, they're taking scans of your feet and watching you walk, which has nothing to do with how you run at all. Yes. So to and, unpack and that telling you on pronation. Yeah. You're talking about the the pictures that they take or when you step in one spot. And I have crazy high arches. So I totally mm -hmm. fed into that, you know, high school, college, the whole thing. Like your arch needs to be supported. And so when they take a mm -hmm. static image, then they say, oh, you need this. And so what you're saying is uh, uh not so fast. That's not a thing anymore. Right. I mean, that has many, many research studies that have proven counter to that as a general recommendation. Now, if you have a, a you know, a person in your clinic right now and you really think getting a whole evaluation and everything that's going on that they could value, you know, they could have some um, improvement from arch support, then by all means, that makes sense. But just doing it as a general recommendation, especially when people aren't even injured, is disproven. Yeah. Not, a, not a good path to take. What else are we doing wrong? Um, I think the next one that I would say is that we are grabbing onto the fact that shoes are somehow magic bullets. I mean, people have sensitivities to shoes, right? And, and it could definitely, especially in, in more elite runners, um, increase your, your margin of performance. But for the everyday recreational runner, you know, if you put on it, the person in the shoe is much more impor important than the shoe on on the person. And so it yes. might, you know, sway you one way or the other, but it's not going to drastically change your performance. I, I was having that conversation with a mom the other day that just moved to our neighborhood and she went over to the, the local high school track and she said all the high schoolers had on like their carbon plated vapor flies and things like that. <laughs> Where I live, we we have issues with right. like we want the best of the best. That's just the culture, right. unfortunately, where I live. Um, so uh, these things that are coming up, like these carbon plated stuff, like that's for performance. That's not for the everyday runner, right? Well, it could be for the everyday runner in the sense that they're they're much more cushioned and they do give you a bit of energy return, a little bit more bounce than some other shoes. But they're not going to improve your times. Your you know your you're not going to like change your PR, your, your, your PR record by 10 minutes. Like it's just not happening. Buy a new and, PR. <laughs> no, I mean, you could, you'd have to practice and run and train and eat well and sleep and, you know, all the other things that make much more of a difference yeah. than your shoes. Um, and I think the what they've started to find in research is that the shoe, the technology that's in the shoe really seems to be best utilized or, or best um, experienced not exploited, but but best captured by those faster runners. So if you're running really fast, the more elite runners, they get a, more of an advantage from the shoes than, mm. than an everyday recreational runner. Now, again, like I said, it's not to say that they don't feel good because comfort is is helpful, comfort fit. You know, pe those are still the main reasons you're, the, the features that you're choosing shoes on. Um, mm. But then the next factor, it's up to you to decide whether you, you know, a $350 shoe to, because yeah. they're comfortable. And, and there was, I, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a paper a couple of years ago kind of looking at that saying, hey, actually the best shoe is the one that's most comfortable. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. So there, there's some there's some evidence of that. Now that has been, you know, um, rigorously tested. There's some studies to support to support that. And just, I think, you know, common common sense seems like there aren't a shoe that's not comfortable for, for many, many reasons, right? You don't want to get blisters. You're not going to, you're going to be moving your foot around in this shoe. You're just not going to, you're not going to do what you um, set out to do if you're in an uncomfortable shoe. 
especially for endurance running. Now for um, for race shoes, so for people that are running in their spikes or they're they're doing different types of races, most of those shoes, you know, in talking with with collegiate and professional athletes, are comfortable, right? It's more about oh, spikes the, are the, not comfortable. The, no, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't it's recall that at all. And getting the lock in, <laughs> yeah. And so it, they're looking for, for that. And the same, I think, with um, trail shoes or climbing shoes. The, the purpose kind of defines the features that you're looking on for selection. Um, but I think one thing that, that's starting to, to get some traction is the, the plate and the foam and the thickness all kind of create what's called the cushioning system. And that has implications for you know, how much, how much return, how much energy it could get to the system when you're running, you know, so how much like um, energy savings or how much you're you feeling better when you're running, you're not, you're not using your muscles as much. Um, but what we're, what they're trying, what a lot of researchers are trying to test now is, you know, is that a good or a bad thing? Because if you're using less muscles, right. then your tendon is, you know, getting less action and that over time could make your tendon less resilient and that's uh. not a good thing and if you need you know x amount of cushion you see these really thick muscles if you get you know a certain amount of cushion that's also you know putting in you on a platform and potentially changing your um, you know your foot angle this way and it could set you up for ankle sprains or falls or Gotcha. So, so you see some research now that's investigating the effects or the influence of those thicker midsoles and um, more resilient midsoles on Achilles tendon in particular and um, mm -hmm. frontal plane, which mean like, you know, rolling in and out of your ankle. So when you're talking so, about so the, there'll be more the, that's coming up. the thicker soles, could we, could we safely put like the hokas in that pile? Would that be just yes. kind of a yes. reference point? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have tried, I, I've got neuromas and so I've always needed mm -hmm. to go a little bit wider. And so someone recommended to me to try them and I clearly do not have enough foot clearance. I can't even run across <laughs> without thinking I'm going to fall on my face, but I see so many people wearing them. And I mm -hmm. think there's this misunderstanding that um, you've got great cushioning, but they don't understand this part called the 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 toe heel drop can you unpack mm -hmm. that and what that means you kind of mentioned the achilles tendon kind of pull all that together for us oh right so so you have hold on. so you have your forefoot right this is your forefoot thickness you have your your rear foot thickness and the difference in that thickness creates your heel drop right how mm -hmm. much um uh, of an inclination your your foot's on and so the hokas think are zero drop, and there's many other uh, other ones that are zero drop um, versus other ones that have you know maybe you know five to ten meters of of lift. And for some individuals, especially people that have tight hamstrings, tight plantar flesh or tight hamstrings, tight Achilles, tight plantar fasciitis, that drop in your heel, even to level ground, you know, pulls on those on those structures. So. Mm -hmm. Again, I think I think mostly the poison is in the dose. If you want to start stretching those things, you, and you you really want to wear hose, and they're bothering you, you know that could be a reason why, and you might have to um, slowly move into those shoes, give you shoes some time to to adjust. Yeah, and taper in. I thought much, I heard that too. Yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely... much like the case with minimal minimal shoes the same thing there there was you know I, the first craze i think was uh the pronation motion control shoes the second craze is minimalist right yep. which is let's do barefoot running and if you really feel like you need to protect your feet from glass i guess you can put on shoe and right and, and, and but the shoe can be very minimal coverage and you know for some people that worked but there's nothing that's a panacea for people that were having you know that already had calf achilles hamstring, plantar fascial issues, that just increases the the strain on those right. tissues and, and, and creates for um, some potential problems. Yeah. And that's something. And now I we're in the third craze. We're in the third craze of super shoes, right? Wait, so, what, what's, what's in the third craze? The third craze is like super shoes. There was a 
Oh, right. Maximalist, yep. but now we're yep. in the super shoes. Yeah. Gotcha. Let's backtrack to, to yeah. minimalist because we were talking a little bit mm -hmm. before we hopped on here about there's some pretty strong voices. I think Katie Bowman's an example um, that literally has written books about how we should just barefoot our bodies and how barefoot is essential for pregnant and postpartum women for the health of our pelvis, all of this stuff. Um, I don't necessarily feel that that's accurate. Um, can you take us back through like the history of barefoot? Like really it did come out when, when born to run the book came out and then everybody just kind of mm -hmm. went crazy there. And then I feel like with pregnancy postpartum, you get these phases that occur in sports and eventually they sort of filter over <laughs> later on to pregnancy mm -hmm. postpartum. I think this is one of those. So uh, unpack the, the, the minimalist kind of craze and you know, what potentially that might mean, um, right or wrong for pregnancy postpartum yeah so so i i so the minimalist barefoot movement you're right kind of in popular media st media started off with the born John book and the description of um the 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 tribe in, in that book you know running you know rubber sole shoes or not at all and then there was some other I think there were, oh God, you're, you're pulling up my memory here, but there were some other studies or anecdotal reports that that looked at um, when people run barefoot, they switch to a four foot strike. This is kind yep. of how it started. And four foot strike um, helped reduce some of the, the the stress that was that was to your knee, right? And it so was that time, better. I use a lot of big quotation right, it was, marks. <laughs> yeah, it was better. It was better because most you know the number one site of injuries endurance running injuries is the knee for recreational runners right and so you know people kind of went with that and and took off but four foot strike running is not optimal for all cases and probably for yeah. all people yeah. and so you you have to to um, pull those two things apart you know for, for some people barefoot running might be helpful if they really need to start re-engaging their foot intrinsic muscles right and they need to they, they do have maybe some knee issues and, and working to a more four, four foot strike has relieved some of the stress on their knee and so you're trying to kind of balance that out i think i think the gate retraining, you know, this kind of starts pulling into gate retraining literature is I think gate retraining seems like a good idea in the short term when you're trying to offload injured tissues and you yeah. still want someone to run. But I don't think from a, a motor system, a musculoskeletal system, um, an, an adaptive system, point it's sh it's a good method long term yeah. because you're you're constraining your body to kind of one one movement and you know you want to have motor flexibility you want to be able to, to your body to easily respond right. to you know unpredictable circumstances so so those two feed in together um but yep. this minimal movement kind of started you know there's some uh, media attention and then it had a little bit of uh literature support and then it just went off, off to the races. Yeah. And when I think about running too, I mean, my end of one here, I might vary between a four foot strike and a rear foot. You do. Strike, yeah. Depending on if I'm running up a hill, if I'm running down a hill, if mm -hmm. I'm on flat, if I'm trying to run faster, slower, like, I think that's kind of normal to have some variation. Um, and I think Absolutely. it's so interesting when you get something like this, that, inevitably hits the public, hits media, and then all of a sudden something is good or bad. It's either mm. everybody should do it or nobody should do it. And I feel like that just, it's its not how things work. It's oversimplifying. And with right. pregnancy postpartum space, I feel like there's a dilution of the research in some of these areas where it's delayed getting to, because you've got a lot of um, providers that only know pelvic floor. They don't know um, sports running, those sorts of things. They're not in that research. And so they catch on to something like, oh yeah, barefoot. And then everybody should do barefoot or 
everybody should do mm -hmm. four foot running or they do a running screen and that's not what they do. And they're like, oh, you're a heel striker. You should stop that. That's bad. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. Let's let you. Yeah. You're, you're, and, and so that kind of scares me. Um, yeah, that's scary too. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm right on the same page with you. <laughs> I think we, we do have this oversimplification and this this misstep of like, this is people say this is good. Why is this good? Yes. Why, what's, how is it working? And then does that apply to my patient? And we right. just like miss that chain, right? Yes, because hundred percent. Yeah, bare you again for a pregnant. Let's say let's take a pregnant woman and she has a lack of, you know, she, her foot is getting flatter, right? Cause the hormones are coming, the weight is coming, yep. her arm is getting flatter, those, mu those tendons are stretching. So it might be a good idea to do some in intrinsic um, foot strength, reinforce the, the arches, the ligament arches, you know, the three major arches of the foot. But again, the, the poison is in the dose. It doesn't necessarily translate to you should walk around barefoot all the time. It's it's kind of setting, which is the whole point of, of PT is, you know, skilled care. You're right. setting and dosing exercise as to create, you know, positive adaptation without going too much and then making an, a negative, you know, hitting into that negative space. Yeah, yeah. And I, we don't really don't do that very well. I, I literally, as you were Speaking, I, it, something just occurred to me. I, I had a FAI surgery about 16 years ago. And prior to that, I had a PT that tried to correct an issue with a rigid orthotic. And I remember for a really, really long time, like I couldn't wear any shoe without the orthotic. I mm -hmm. couldn't hike. And then one day I was just like, screw this. I'm done doing this. And slowly adapted my way back down so that, you know, I mm -hmm. walk in Birkenstocks. I wear running shoes that have like a eight, nine millimeter drop. Um, I walk around the house barefoot. I'm barefoot right now. Like it's the mm -hmm. variance. But I remember like when I was in that orthotic and I was making it just a certain way, like it was really hard for me to deviate from that once I got stuck in that. And right. I think that's a concern right. too, when you say to moms, you have to do this. And then they make this change. They lose that resilience. They would lose that adaptability that you were kind of mentioning earlier. Right. Um, and the goal, I think, I think for me, the goal would be, you should be able to wear any shoe for a little bit of time and yeah. not completely fall apart. Right. That's right. the point. Like you should have, be able to have that flexibility, that adaptability and come back to your preferred. And so I think these really like militant work blanket statements are are, yeah. are not doing anyone much good. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and that's always that gets my spidey sense up is when I'm I'm not a good Kool-Aid drinker. I'm just not. And whenever I hear, well, you've got to do this or don't do that, you know that there's something behind it that's not right. And and it really I think it's hard, especially as early clinicians and people trying to understand things, it's hard to go along with, you know, well, it depends. I mean, that's really mm -hmm. hard for a new grad PT trying to unpack mm -hmm. all this stuff to be, it depends because they don't know what it is. <laughs> like what it depends yeah. on what, what do you mean? It's a lot easier to be a technician and give blanket advice. Um, circling around to kind of your, your work in academia, like for newer clinicians, how do you help them bridge that gap in these areas mm -hmm. where it's not going to be black and white? It's going to be you know, maybe areas that, of running and gait analysis that you don't understand or you're not especially good at. It's going to be looking at, um, you know, where that person is hormonally. Like wh when there's a lot of factors going on, how do you help a newer set of eyes kind of step foot into uncertainty? Yeah. So I, I usually tell the students and the, you know, we have a residency program here, the residents, mm -hmm. we try to build out frameworks. So that you can have this method or mode of thinking or like applying information into different, you know, uh, you know part of the framework or coding it correctly to mm -hmm. get to, to make a judgment call because the interventions always change, right? I should, right. can't teach you an intervention. They're all, I mean, again, like the crazes go up and down, the interventions change, you know, hopefully as you get more experience and you kind of bring um, information from other 
disciplines, your yep. thought process and thinking changes as well. And so I, I try to tell them to, you know, it, let's let's take pronation, for example, the pronation um, paradigm is, okay, here's the, here's the premise, right? Here are the, the, here's a rationale behind it. Okay, what does that mean? You know, from a musculoskeletal perspective, perspective from a biomechanical perspective, from a multiple perspective, you've learned yep. all these things. From a, you know, a, um, uh, and then putting it into kind of context, if you can kind of get them in lights, and then, you know, for running, you know, the fundamental requirements of running, you can go off that, even if you don't, even if you don't know how or what exactly is going on with the person, you know, and let this person wants to run, okay, what are the requirements to run? Right. And then you can go back up and check in their in their movement system. Do they have? Do they even have the capacity to do all these things? Yeah. So that's that's usually how I, I tell them to, to look at it and to co continuously kind of keep checking, um, keep keep checking in with the literature. Keep trying to to kind of connect the recommendation with the reasons behind it because yep. sometimes the reason behind it you know again for for pronation for looking at heel eversion or inversion looking at pronation whatnot you know those things have have don't have support from a lot of, of, of uh, research studies and so yeah. you, you know things get updated things get changed so if you're doing a running evaluation or doing a running assessment somewhere and you're looking at heel eversion inversion to try to recommend a shoe in an uninjured person. Well, that whole process is of null now, right? Null and void yep. now. Yep. So you got to kind of know what you, know what you're doing and not, you know, take a template from someone and just. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I, I honestly think that um, that's been one of the benefits I think of, of social media on our profession mm -hmm. is there are people that I trust and are really on top of the research. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking Rich Willie for one, Chris Johnson, oh, like they're yeah. awesome about staying up on stuff. They've actually both been on the show. Um, mm -hmm. and I will follow them because I know that this is their bread and butter. They're going to be into mm -hmm. it. They're going to pick it apart. And then um, that's kind of a fast way for me to get information to be like, all right, well, now how can I apply it to my population? So um, I, I do know, you know, for the, the typical clinician or coach or trainer, access to literature is challenging from a resource perspective, right. but then also um, being a good uh, consumer and understanding methodology and all that kind of stuff, which I think is especially important with when you're working with women, because a lot of methodology in the past, especially in running is, is based on primarily men. Um, so, but it, yeah, if you can't do it yourself and if you're not sure about your ability to vet, find somebody you trust, that's really good at picking that stuff apart. Um, um, and then that can at least give you a place to start to kind of where to go. So I like that. Absolutely. And there's a, yeah. there's a lot of open source journals now that are kind of coming yes. to mind that I think yep. have really been helpful. Yep. No, I think so too. Um, and, and making sure too, that you're, looking at a trusted source and not some weird predatory journal. Right. <laughs> That's right, a whole nother right, animal. Right, right, oh my gosh. Right. All right. And, and truly like thinking for yourself. I think yes. a, lot of, at least a lot of the students I see sometimes, you know, will ask me about a tweet that they saw yep. or, you know, you, you really have to filter through your own, you know, your own professional um, mm -hmm. sense of whether or not you, you think this is something that's, you know, tested yes. or not. Yeah, no, there's Twitter's a lot of a, information coming at you. Yeah, Twi or Twitter's X. a funny yeah, place, X. especially in <laughs> uh, yeah, whatever it's called this week. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's actually some. It's it's actually a fantastic place to get uh, COVID information. By the way, there's a lot of researchers on there, but um, mm -hmm. PT sometimes it has its moments. So uh, <laughs> definitely know right. where your source is. Make sure you vet them. Make sure that they're you know figure out what their bias is because we all do have our own little bit of, of bias oh. there. So. Absolutely. Um, let's let's uh, completely make a left turn here. Um, okay. un, do you mind diving in a little bit with like your experience um, kind of going into pregnancy and postpartum and what kind of your choices were as far as running and then kind of where you're at now? Yeah. So I was a runner, recreational runner. I've done, you know, seven marathons and 
I don't know, 25 half marathons and, you know, a bunch of other races. Um, and then I got pregnant with my first child and I was okay. I probably ran until kind of like month four or five. Mm-hmm. And then I just, it just did not feel good. Right. And I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I stayed active, but I'm, I'm a pretty big believer in, you know, I have a good barometer of what's discomfort and just lack of motivation versus yep. what could, you know, be a potential problem. So I'm like, I'm just going to stop. Um, and then I, when my daughter was born, you know, I think it, it, it's funny because we did a survey um, when I was in my, in my postdoc, we did a, a, a pregnancy and postpartum running biomechanics study with a survey. And a lot of the, the, the survey results, uh, so some of the women had a negative experience, right? a negative mm. uh, connection to running. And I, I'm like, that's how I felt. It just really didn't become, it wasn't relaxing. It wasn't just relieving. It wasn't fun anymore because I'd have no. to, you know, I have like 45 minute window to get everything into the car. So I don't want to run on a treadmill. Everything into the car, down to some park that has a loop, get my daughter out hopefully she either falls asleep yeah right? and she doesn't she doesn't she's not lying. it just became just like a like a a task rather than something you know pre-pregnancy i used to really really enjoy yep. was, you know, for, for hours yep. and so you know i know that's not the case for for many women but i think you know we really should be aware that um you know, you're, you're probably losing running partners. And, and we found this in the study where people were running with groups, with a partner, postpartum, everyone was running alone. Yeah, they were kind of running on a, on a trail, right? Where they were running on trails and doing different types where almost everyone was doing an easy run. And many people had 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 to have had had to have switched to a treadmill, right? So uh, you went right. from like, you know, where I'm in Seattle, so you went to like running the Burke Gilman in this beautiful you know, beautiful landscape and your friend to like your basement on a treadmill. For I hate treadmills. Minutes, you know? I hate them. Yeah. So I think you, 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 the, you gotta get kind of pack all that stuff in when you're, when you're, you know, dealing with someone or treating someone postpartum because all of that, all of those contextual factors, I think really play into your enjoyment yeah. and your, your motivation. And the other, the other piece that was, um, you know, particularly important for some of the, the the more competitive runners is the um they had really lost their speed. Yes. And that had created a, a really negative feeling and you know potentially like an anxiety provoking feeling post you know postpartum. And so there might be aside from all the musculoskeletal things that are going on, there's all these other kind of like psychological emotional right. things. Aside from your child, right? <laughs> aside right, from exactly. Having, like, exactly. Baby. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 with my oldest, I stopped at like 19 weeks because it was just excruciating. My bladder was uncomfortable. I was having mm -hmm. SPD stuff and I was like, nope, we're not doing this anymore. Did mm -hmm. get back to running with him with a stroller. But then when you get to that stage where they just start pitching stuff out of the stroller right? and yeah. then also when they're screaming so hard, you finally take them out and then they won't go back in because they you know, turn into a rigid board. Mm -hmm. You're like, no, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. finally, yeah. now, like last couple of years, like probably, you know, the onset of the pandemic just sort of spurred me forward because I needed time to myself. Like that was really like, okay, I'm enjoying this now, but I also have time because my kids sleep and I don't have to wipe any butts or, you know, mm -hmm. any. well, I mean, you're there well, now too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm on the edge. I mean, I've done a couple like five days and 10 days for with my friends, but not not yeah. really training in between. But yeah. it's funny because I do, you know, as part of um my research interest, the lab, um, the my previous lab used to do uh, running assessments to whoever, professional to recreational runners. Yeah. And you actually see this like, you know, 16 to maybe 32, and then there's this big gap, and then you see people coming back at like four five to yeah, you know, forty five plus. And I think it really is because you just really don't have a lot of time to yourself to develop your practice, to develop your running, you know, your running practice. Just yeah, get on the treadmill, get it in, right. and that's it. It's just yeah. a box that you're checking. I've had a lot of new mm -hmm. moms in the last probably year or so that 
you know, they had it in their head that they were going to get right back. And I was like, all right, well, if you want to do this, I'm happy to, you know, support you. And then maybe about 12 to 15 weeks, they put the brakes on themselves and said, you know what? Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this right now. And it wasn't because they were symptomatic or anything was wrong. They just didn't want the pressure. And I was mm -hmm. like, good on you. Like, I, finally, we're getting, you know, moms that are like, um, no, I'm not playing this game anymore. I will get there when I get there. Um, and I'm going to enjoy this. And I was like, I, I, I wish that, you know, that happened, you know, more our vintage, but um, I'm, that doesn't mean yeah. I'm going to go back and do it over again. Just to, to see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully people are better now because there are recommendations and, right. you yeah. know, I, 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 I had, you know, I was at my suite and they're like, just do what you can do it. Right. You know, we had you nothing. Want. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. You anything. couldn't, there was really nothing, really no, yeah. no guide at all. Yeah. Now you mentioned um, something about strollers and kind of looking at that. Had you, ha have you kind of dove into strollers as far as postpartum running? Well, I, I did a, my PhD was on um, kind of like functional muscle synergies in the sense that you have, you know, you're, you're, you're your muscles aren't just working in isolation, but they have this whole chain that's kind of lighting up. And so if you're shutting down one because you're just holding this for, mm. um, you know, you're just pushing forward, how, how does that affect the rest of your body? So mm. we didn't actually use the stroller. We, we kind of um, just did unilateral um, arm swing, but we did see some differences in, in contralateral knee biomechanics. And, and again, that was my interest to see like, you have this you have this very isolated component of, of the tissue that's in question that you're really trying to get the stress off of but in a broader sense especially when you're trying to build resilience or adaptability or flexibility how does that how does your whole body work mm -hmm. to do that and so again i was kind of using that as a use case and since that and since then we actually you know i've had a couple um startups reach out to me about um stroller design but Mm -hmm. I haven't done too much past that because I have my interests are kind of um, like I said in assessment and monitoring and yep footwear. Yeah, no, I've seen um, you know we we did the the single bob and then the double bob. That's mm -hmm. like a bust. There's no way I was gonna you know run with mm -hmm. that. But I've seen that I I can't remember the name of it. There's one that it's a trailer and you strap mm -hmm. it around your waist. And I, I've got to figure that's a, a little bit different too. But I, anytime I'm talking to moms and they want to get going on the stroller, I'm like, ideally, if you can start without the stroller first yes. um, yeah. and build that base because you do run incredibly different. Um, the mm -hmm. only, like, I think saving grace of a stroller is if you're an overstrider, you really can't overstride with a stroller because you're going to kick that plate. And <laughs> so I think right. that's the only, the only good thing, but um, right. yeah. And I, don't, I think you have I don't to realize days. You have to realize too that you know that your trunk movement is important to your pelvis movement, which is right. important to your leg positioning. So it's all kind of, you know, interdependent. And so if you're locking down one one area, other things yep. get affected. Now whether that tips over into a problem or not, you know, depends on the person. But you yep. just have to be aware of some of that stuff. Yeah. Or if you start yeah. running with a stroller and it doesn't feel right, that doesn't mean just right. do it more and you'll get used to it. It may mean right. that you might want to get this checked out a little right. bit. Right. So. Yeah, that's important. Okay. So how about some take home as far as, um, okay. you know, postpartum moms, one of the things that um, I always recommend is when you're trying to get back to running again, new sports bra, because let's be honest, mm -hmm. we need a little bit more support and never a bad idea to grab a new pair of shoes um, because mm -hmm. potentially your foot size change. I know mine got a lot wider. I went that, up half the yeah. size. Um, your old ones are probably older than they really should be. Like, let's say we just have our local running shoe store. That's kind of meh as far as recommendations, where, sh what should we do? How do we pick out a shoe? So you're a hundred percent right. And we, this was a study where we found that shoe foot width and foot length increased postpartum by a half a size or more. So All right. <laughs> go to, sh go, go to the foot store. Go to the full, go to the run the the, the uh, running shoe store and get med property and and realize that your foot likely has increased a size yep. right and the width of it has as well so uh, and I to, to to you know not just postpartum runners but to everyone your dynamic person your body is changing over time and so just because you wore X shoe you know 
last year or even right. in your heydays of high school doesn't mean that's the shoe that's going to work for you today. Right. So go there, try on a bunch of different shoes, yep. pick the one that's the most comfortable and preferably the lightest for you. And, and don't assume that because you had that shoe in the previous version, that the newer version is going yes. to be exactly Correct. the same. <laughs> Correct. I hate Correct. That. And, and uh, this is another, and this is no knock to, because I know people, very, very knowledgeable people at running specialty stores, but they are educated on the features of the shoe and the differences across the features of the shoes that they have in their right. store. And they are also, most of them are runners. So they'll give you their anecdotal, you know, end of one experience. Right. And beyond those recommendations, I would stop. I would stop yeah. at that. Right. You can give, you can get, take in their knowledge from, you know, a, a personal story. You can ask them about the differences in the features, but if they're telling you which shoe you need, no. Yep. That's and if thing. they take, if they take you over to a pronation section or a supination section, run away. <laughs> no, well, just try on all the shoes and, and which everyone feels yourself. good. Yeah, yeah. There we go. There we yeah. go. That sounds yes. good. Yes. No, yes. even I, I have a friend of mine that uh, we did a little field trip to, um, we have a, a great local running store here, Pacers, um, and in, in the DC area. And I went with a PT friend of mine and we did a little field trip and we did a little video analysis and we got to look at it together mm -hmm. and, um, find a shoe that I was happy with and, and have really been comfortable with. And, and, even those of us that are in the field, like it's not a bad idea to, to, to get some fresh ideas. And, and especially yeah. my recommendations for those of you specifically that are in pelvic health and do not have a background um, other than what you learned in PT school for gait analysis, grab your ortho sports PT buddy that does this a lot and go with them to the shoe store and figure that out. Don't think that you can DIY this stuff because what mm -hmm. you learned 15 years ago is probably not right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and yeah. I think put your heads together. What, yes. what do we know from running biomechanics? What is yes. that stress? Okay. That seemed the same in public health. Would that help or not help? Or, you know, yep. Amanda and I did this course a couple of years ago and it was so helpful because, you know, exactly like talking to people, that have different disciplines and different specialties yep. really, really help you hone your own clinical, ex you know, expertise. Very much so. And I think especially in, in our area, because there isn't a lot of data, we do have to pull, I mean, the, the, the UK guidelines, that was just a culmination of, hey, what's out there that's remotely related to this and what can we pull from it? So ideally it gets better, but I also think that's where good inspirational ideas come from. Like, um, and I, I love it when other PTs kind of start to play around in pelvic health, but have a background in neuro or, or sports or something like that. I think there's always so much to learn from other areas. So, um, mm -hmm. super cool. All right. So at the end of every episode, um, everybody gets some questions and I've added a few new okay. ones just for fun. Okay. All right. What, uh, book are you reading now or podcast are you listening to, or even what paper is your jam right now? Oh, I actually just started a new book. It's called The Right Kind of Wrong. Ooh. It's by Amy Edmondson. It's about, um, I'm going to get her nomenclature wrong, but important failures, like basic failures versus I like it. Like intelligent failures. And so like how that. those kind of affect progress and growth. Yeah, it's good so far. Okay, cool. I like that. Um, your favorite activity since becoming a mom? Um, is, is just drinking coffee by myself before the kids get up. <laughs> totally counts. And I think, Nobody up. <laughs> I think everyone listening right now is like, oh yeah, this is, this is my girl. She sees me. Yeah. And I'm like, yep. No, I, it's so hard when they get older. Like I do drop off three mornings a week mm -hmm. and, um, I have to be conscious of when I turn on the coffee because I don't want to like fill the cup and put it down and then have to go do carpool. I was like, no, no, no. We need to make sure that it's fresh and I can sit and actually enjoy it. So I love yeah. that answer. I see. Okay. You. Okay. Um, okay. One piece of advice uh -huh. for new moms. Oh. Um, don't beat yourself up. Like, you have it. a lot going on there. You'll get back. Your, your body will come back maybe in it's, you know, 2.0 version, but you'll be able to get back to, to doing things. Right. I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Don't beat yourself up and don't, don't think that, you know, it's, it's gone for good. Love it. 
I, I feel like the forties are like the new twenties. I don't know. I just, I haven't yeah. been, I'm 47 now and I haven't been this strong probably ever. So um, yes, you will get it back. It might take a few years, but you get there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who is someone, so this is the question that got me to you. Oh, um, who okay. is someone either in pregnancy, postpartum, running, like whatever, like who should we know about? Okay. So for pregnancy and postpartum running, Shafali Christopher. Oh yeah, she we're we're a huge fan. Absolutely. She's been on a couple times already. <laughs> and I think for all things sports bras, Julie Steele. Ooh, okay. Yeah, she's amazing. I'm gonna have to check that one out. She's done I'm... a lot of research, a lot of research in sports bra. And oh my gosh. Breast movement. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, how do you spell yeah. her last name so I can Google stalk her? Uh I think it's S T E E. I think it's S T E E L E. Okay. All she's right. I am out, on she's that of, one. Uh, Australia. Oh, of, of course. Australians are so yeah. good. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're going to, we're going to definitely yeah. do some Google stalking on boob movement in, in uh, activity. I love it. Um, and then finally for you, what does it mean for you to be an active mom in postpartum? Um, I think it means that I have not lost that piece of myself, right? I can still recognize myself. In yeah. the, the the things that I like to do and and the um, the different activities I like, but it's also you know my kids are kind of have become a part of that, especially in COVID. I think it used to be an activity that I had set aside that I compartmentalized yep. and only did by myself, and now you know my kids and my activities and my interests are all all bleeding together, which is which is good and fun. That, that's what you dream of, like when yeah. they're, you know, just yeah. sucking your boobs dry and, you know, keeping you up at 2 a.m. <laughs> about how you're going to do all this stuff. And then finally it's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. If you want to check out um, Christine's most recent paper, Running Injury Paradigms and Their Influence on Footwear Design Features and Running Runner Assessment Methods, and you can read the rest there, um, you can check that out. <laughs> um, it's on PubMed is the link and it is open access which is, I, I love that. It's, a, it's, it, it's amazing, especially for people who don't have academic access. Um, Christine Agresta, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so glad I Google stalked you. And thanks, Amanda Olson, for, for giving us your name. And thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Did you enjoy the podcast? If so, leave us a five-star review on iTunes and tell a friend to do the same. Are you a postpartum mom or postpartum pro wanting to know more about getting back to running after baby? check out all my free goodies on carriepagliano.com. This podcast represents the opinions of Dr. Carrie Pagliano and her guests to the show. The content should not be taken as medical advice and is for entertainment purposes only. Always consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.